When I was first diagnosed, I was simply given medication. Um, I was never really explained, at least the explanation that was given to me was not explained very well. I just knew that, oh, this will help you feel better. No explanation was given as to how it works on the brain, what it does for my brain, what the side effects are, what the long-term side effects are, what the research says, or like how much research has been done on these drugs. None of that was given to me. It essentially was just here, trust us, we're doctors. Which 100% yes, you should trust doctors. Like don't trust me because like I didn't go to school for it. I am the least qualified person to prescribe or to treat anybody. But at the same time, I believe that everybody should be fully aware of what they're taking, should be fully aware and comfortable with what they're taking. Knowledge is power. So the more you know, the more you can protect yourself against things. why it might make people who have bipolar disorder or at least people living with bipolar disorder one manic or hypomanic is because buspar has a high affinity for serotonin like i don't really know the different receptors and it has a high affinity for the 5-ht1a again i'm not a science person i have no idea what's so like special about that receptor but with the serotonin piece think about serotonin and what serotonin does it's the happy chemical and since Buspar has a high affinity for that receptor, Buspar is known as a serotonin receptor agonist, which essentially means that it increases serotonin within the brain, and that increase in serotonin leads to an alleviation of anxiety. Typically speaking, Buspar is used as an adjunct or a add-on to another medication. Uh, most popularly, it's used to add on to an SSRI, which is an antidepressant. SSRIs are not just used to treat depression, but they're also used to treat anxiety. SSRIs and Buspar together typically work well to treat anxiety. So if you have like generalized anxiety disorder or any other type of severe anxiety disorder, Buspar typically works well with that SSRI to combat the symptoms that you may be experiencing. While it works on serotonin with a high affinity, it also works on dopamine. And by dopamine, I mean it works on the D2 receptors that help regulate dopamine. As I get into talking about like these receptors and specifically the types of receptors and the subreceptors and the presynaptic versus postsynaptic receptors, I get confused, y'all. Um, but this is how I understand it. In addition to binding to serotonin receptors, it is also an antagonist for the D2 receptors within the brain, but with a weak affinity. Specifically, it blocks presynaptic D2 transmission and then antagonizes postsynaptic D2 transmission. However, that only really occurs at higher doses. I use the word agonist and antagonist like y'all know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> let's define those because look, low-key, I also don't really know exactly what those mean either. Agonist means that it initiates or creates a physiological response when combined with the receptor. Antagonist is somewhat, at least from my understanding, the opposite in the sense that it inhibits a response. So it's a substance that interferes or inhibits a physiological response. When we look at receptors and when I talk about like D2 receptors, when I talk about the serotonin, receptors. A receptor essentially is a protein molecule that is receiving a transmission or receiving a signal. So, so serotonin, dopamine, all of that are neurotransmitters which are essentially signals or messages that our brain is sending. Messages that are telling our brain to release or like to do something to... it's a message telling our brain to do something. So a receptor is essentially a chemical that is receiving a message by binding to a specific chemical. When I talk about affinity or high affinity versus low affinity, affinity essentially is the strength or the attractiveness between a receptor and the actual signal being transmitted. So if it's low affinity, it means it has a low attraction and it's like not really attracted. Like it's like it kind of is attracted, like it might select you, it might not. I don't really, I don't really know how it works, but if it's a high affinity, it means it's super attracted and it's super like, yes, come here. like. I don't know if I'm explaining this right. <laughs> In a nutshell, what you need to know about low affinity versus high affinity is that if there's low affinity, for example, buspirone is an antagonist for the D2 receptor with a low or weak affinity, it means that in order for it to act on that, you need a higher concentration of it in order for it to actually bind with it and to, to actually manipulate it. That is, if you want to have, again, think about receptors and about res what receptors do, 
if you want to see if you want it to bind correctly or if you want it to bind enough for it to have a physiological response you're going to need a higher concentration of it because it has a weak affinity and vice versa for like a high affinity you need a lower concentration of it the whole point in all of this though and the point that i want to convey to y'all that when looking at how buspar works to treat anxiety this is what researchers and pharmacologists are looking at, essentially. In a nutshell, they're looking at how Buspar interacts with serotonin, how it interacts with dopamine, or more specifically, how it binds to the serotonin receptors and the D receptors, which are the dopamine receptors. I did that whole amateur explanation because the process of binding or when, or when looking at how Buspar sends out the messages or the chemicals that bind to these different receptors, keeping in mind that these receptors are reading these messages. It matters because that's how our brain knows when to release serotonin, when to inhibit serotonin, when to release dopamine, when to inhibit dopamine. And basically, pharmacologists, researchers, doctors are looking at where this happens within the synapse, presynaptic or postsynaptic, um, how it happens, what dosages these things are happening at. Me, when I was taking it, I'm not 100% sure about this. As I was saying, I originally started Buspar at a very low dosage or at a fairly normal to low dosage, and it worked to end dopamine. From what I've read in the research, um, there's been kind of a long time coming with this, but we haven't fully, when I say we, I mean like I don't know what the fuck. I think I've made that clear. Researchers haven't come to a consensus and they've only more recently have come to a better understanding of the way serotonin works and more importantly, how serotonin influences mental illness or mental health and anxiety specifically. Within my literature review, there are mixed results and mixed examples, which is why I think it's best to explain it as dysregulation of serotonin or a dysregulation within the serotonin circuitry within the brain, essentially, They've seen that decreases or a deficiency in serotonin can cause anxiety. More likely though, it causes depression. But along with depression comes anxiety. At the same time, increases in serotonin also cause anxiety, um, causes panic, causes restfulness or restlessness. But rather, what you would want is more so a middle ground. You don't want to have too much serotonin, but you also don't want to have too little serotonin. And I think that kind of explains maybe what I was experiencing, maybe, I don't know. It also would explain, therefore, why just by increasing Buspar, you're not going to just decrease your anxiety. You don't want to have too much serotonin. With so much in pharmacology and with so much I'm learning with medications and with neurotransmitters, there is a homeostasis point, a very fine line. Sometimes it's not very fine, but there is a middle ground that you want to stay within and if you go too high too low you don't want to go outside of that middle ground because that's when you start experiencing negative side effects and the same thing can be said for dopamine dopamine as a neurotransmitter is also very important for our moods it works within the reward processing centers in our brain um, it's responsible for pleasure and desire it's also responsible for fear and for panic hence why dopamine has been linked to anxiety as well slash more specifically dopamine from my understanding is more so linked to panic disorder and panic attacks which is a type of anxiety i guess but is different from the anxiety that you might be experiencing if you're depressed but nonetheless it still causes anxiety i honestly feel like i'm confused because researchers are confused like there is a mixed debate in all of this nonetheless both of these neurotransmitters matter serotonin being more researched or explains anxiety that happens within depression within generalized anxiety disorder i think and dopamine being more of the panicking panic disorder um, type of anxiety on that end of the spectrum, but there's still both anxiety and even if you have generalized anxiety disorder You can still have panic attacks. Even if you have panic disorder um, You still have like anxiety all over and I know that's a really bad way to explain Generalized anxiety disorder, but bringing it back home Buspar is believed to work on both of these neurotransmitters and yeah <laughs> I feel like I've just been giving a big old bad science lesson. I'm done trying to explain the science of it. Um, hopefully you have a amateur understanding like I do. So like what the fuck do you do then if you have panic disorder and bipolar disorder? You know at the beginning of this video I talked about how Buspar is often commonly used with SSRIs but again people who are bipolar disorder especially I believe bipolar disorder type 1 aren't really supposed to take SSRIs. Again this is the general consensus because SSRIs increase mania as well. So it's like, 
the fuck are you supposed to do? That is why it's super important or like why I was trying to place an emphasis on explaining the neurotransmission piece, um, you know, where it's interacting in the brain, um, what receptors it's binding to, the levels of affinity um, these neurotransmitters have for those receptors, whether or not it's being antagonized or agonized inhibited or increased. All of that matters when it comes to pharmacology because when you're dealing with customers, when you're dealing with patients or when you're dealing with people with comorbid disabilities, hopefully you see why that matters because you don't want to increase or block the wrong neurotransmitters at the wrong times within neurotransmission because then you're all fucked up. Hopefully that also begins to explain why it's so difficult to treat people who are living with comorbid disabilities. And that's for a host of different reasons. Not only is it because, you know, you have to figure out what you need to block, what you need to increase, and where you need to do it at within neurotransmission, but also think about the fact that you need ways to measure all of this and science is only so far along like we could do a lot of things but but relatively this is all pretty new stuff which is why it's medication roulette other than being able to measure the serotonin within somebody which i believe we recently kind of just figured out how to do via i don't know the type of scans it is but i believe that's a recent phenomenon that we can actually do that regardless it's a lot easier to just give people medication and say like how do you feel does that like is it working or not nah? Not easier for us, definitely easier for doctors. This might have taken kind of a negative turn in the sense that like, I don't wanna say that we're all just fucked. I mean, we all kind of are just fucked, but not really. And it's like 50-50. The bright shining horizon in all of this is that there are steps that have been put into place or there are practices that have been put into place as to what you should be treating first and how you should be treating it. So. Theoretically, doctors aren't just, you know, giving us random drugs and just seeing what works. It's not quite like that's what I would do. It's not quite that simplistic. They're not only looking at the chemical structures of these drugs because that determines the whole neurotransmission piece, but they are also looking at which ones do they treat first. So with bipolar disorder, typically you treat the bipolar disorder first before moving on to like the panic disorder slash the generalized anxiety disorder or whatever the fuck else you have. You get your mood stable first, and then you go from there. Or like for myself, I have a lot of shit, but um, my ADHD right now is kind of not being treated because my bipolar disorder was out of whack, I was not eating, a whole bunch of other stuff was fucked up. And in the past, Adderall was the only thing that worked for my ADHD, but like Adderall, like it, it's gonna fuck other things up for me too. So my doctor said that we had to start with treating my mood, start with stabilizing that first, going into remission, and then we can look at, you know, maybe it won't be a stimulant, but then we can look at um, ADHD treatment, if that makes sense. So think of it like a sandwich. You wouldn't start making a sandwich with meat. I mean, maybe you would, but you need like bread first, then you need the meat, then you need like the lettuce or whatever the fuck else you put on your sandwich. Um, you start with the foundation and you go from there. I'm not saying it's not gonna suck. You know, if you have a sandwich and you don't have any condiments or like it's a dry ass sandwich, no one wants that. No one wants a dry ass sandwich. But if you're hungry, you still want a sandwich. So essentially, you know, you just need some time, need some patience to build up to having the perfect sandwich. Woo! That was a lot, y'all. Hopefully all of that made sense to y'all. Hopefully that kind of explains, number one, why Buspar potentially makes people who are bipolar disorder or people with schizophrenia elevated, manic, psychosis, why it causes these things. At the same time, hopefully you learned a little bit about how Buspar works within the brain in general, a little bit more about neurotransmission, about how these drugs are interacting with serotonin and dopamine, or rather how Buspar specifically interacts with serotonin and dopamine. Hopefully you also learned a little bit more about comorbidities with bipolar disorder, uh, a little bit more about a little bit more about why they're so hard to treat, how doctors are treating them, and what is the current common practice doctors are using these days to treat people like us or like me. If you got those three things, at least an amateur understanding or a summary view, then I've done my job. If not, please let me know in the comments below. If I said anything wrong, comments below. If you're completely confused, comments below. All of that would be greatly helpful for me and for anyone else watching this video. As always, remember to subscribe and turn on those subscription notifications so that you can find out when I'm uploading new videos. All right, y'all, stay golden, stay fresh, love y'all to pieces, and I'll hit y'all back with a new video soon.